Hello, and welcome to another lecture for my class on psychological testing and assessment. As you can see from the title, this lecture will be on interpretation of the MMPI 2 RF. Uh, and buckle up because this is going to be a long lecture. Well, there are a lot of slides in it. I'm going to try and move through them quickly, so hopefully it won't take too awful long. Uh, an amount of time in your lives, and even if it does, hopefully it will be interesting, because if you're like me and you're interested in tests, the MMPI uh, looms large in the history of testing and its importance to psychology, especially clinical psychology. Uh, you may have encountered the MMPI-2 uh, or the current MMPI-2 RF in your clinical work or in your classwork, so it's an important test, it's out there, it's worth knowing about. And of course, if you're using it, the biggest challenge is how do you interpret all the information which, as you know, or as you will see, is on this test. That kind of leads me to my first point, and that's that interpreting the MMPI can be complicated. Um, it has a long history, a long history if we consider the MMPI-2, the MMPI, the MMPI-2, and now the MMPI. MMPI 2 RF. It goes back, you know, many decades. Uh, there's a lot of um, literature on it, especially older versions of the test, like the older MMPI 2 has a very large clinical and empirical literature. So just, uh, you know, if you, you doubt me, I went to the library for our, our university and did a search for any source that has MMPI-2 but not MMPI-2 RF and came up with literally thousands of sources. And so there's this large empirical and clinical literature out there which is useful for guiding you in terms of how you can use this test, how you can interpret various scales and the indices on it. And if, you know, back in the day, if you're someone who used the MMPI-2 a lot, you'd hopefully be familiar with a lot of this literature and you would have your preferred ways of using the test. You may also have, or you may also continue to use one of the published books about the MMPI-2, of which there are quite a few. Uh, I just picked this one here because it's from the Essential series from Wiley, and it's for the MMPI-2, and it provides, I think, a very nice summary of how this, uh, how this test works and how you can interpret the various scales and, and indices on it. Um, as of the time of this recording, in the late fall of 2016, the Essentials series hasn't yet published a book for the MMPI-2 RF, which is the latest version of the MMPI-2. And this actually brings me to a kind of an interesting question, which is, can you still use the MMPI-2? You know, if you were in clinical practice, would it be okay? Uh, would it be ethical for use, you to use the MMPI-2 and then perhaps refer to one of these books like the Essentials series book or, or some other book as your source for how to interpret the test? Uh, the answer to that question is yes. You know, there are many places that still do use the MMPI-2 and many professionals, clinical psychologists especially, are more familiar with it and more comfortable with it than the newest version of the test. Um, Pearson, the company that makes uh, MMPI-2 uh, and MMPI-2-RF still sells the earlier version of the test, the MMPI-2, and they still support it. And by support it, I mean uh, they uh, periodically publish updated norms for use for scoring it. So the last uh, norms update was, I believe, 2009. And I should say, um, just recently I called up Cy uh, Pearson Psychor, the publisher of this test, and asked one of their representatives on the phone, because I was really confused about this. I was looking around the internet, I was you know, uh, checking some of the sources I have, trying to decide, can you still use the MMPI-2? And the guy who I talked to on the phone said, oh yeah, you can still use it, and we can still, you know, we still, um, we still sell it. Well, of course they do. It makes them a lot of money. Um, but yeah, you, the, the, in the, this guy I talked to encouraged me to, as a professional, use my best judgment in deciding whether to use the MMPI-2 or the MMPI-2-RF. Um, my best judgment, uh, as you'll see in just a slide or so, is that I prefer to use the MMPI-2-RF than to use the MMPI-2. But to be clear, it's still not exactly um, an ethical violation or a professional uh, standards violation to use this older version of the test, provided that, I would argue, you're using the most up-to-date norms for the test and the most up-to-date literature on how the test performs and how one should use it. So again, I teach the MMPI-2 RF in my limited use of this test clinically. I, I've, I've tended to use the MMPI-2 RF instead of the MMPI-2. Um, 
pardon me, it's the most current version of the MMPI system. So at least if you think back to ethical standard 9.08, which discourages us from using out of date tests, um, you know, the flip side of that is encouragement to use the most up to date tests. Um, that's MMPI 2 RF. Now MMPI 2 isn't technically considered out of date, but it's still an older test, even if it, we use our, the newest norms for it, and it reflects a somewhat older approach to testing. And it's also longer, and there's some other disadvantages, I think, relatively speaking, to, um, to uh, in comparison to the MMPI 2 RF. The RF is easier to use, I think it's more psychometrically clean, and the interpretation, as complicated as it is, and you'll see that in the coming slides, is, I think, relatively more straightforward than is the interpretation of the older MMPI-2. So, you know, the MMPI-2, uh, interpreting it can be complicated. Um, it's an old test, if we think about all the different versions over the years. There's a lot of information on the current version of it. Uh, the current, current version, the 2RF, has 51 scales. That's a ton of information about your client, assuming he or she has filled out all of the questions on the test, the 300 some odd questions that there are. Now there are currently some books that are published about the RF, um, and you can see them here, including some which in give advice on interpreting both the MMPI-2 and the MMPI-2 RF. Um, well, you know, interestingly, to me at least, the Essential series hasn't published their uh, book for the 2 RF yet, although I assume they will soon. Um, but in any case, there are some books out there. Um, you can find them on Amazon, you can order them directly from the publishers. The one on the far right by Yossi Yosef, Yossi for short, uh, Ben Poraf is probably the most um, authoritative uh, one out there. Um, it's the basis for the approach to interpretation that I'm covering in this lecture, and that's really because uh, Ben Poraf is one of the authors of the current MMPI and the support, uh, that is to say the MMPI 2 RF, and uh, the support materials that ship with that test. So, of course, it's he's the authority, or as close to an authority as we have. And to be clear, I teach a pretty basic uh, approach to interpretation that hopefully looks a lot like other approaches to interpretation I've highlighted or explained for other tests. You know, the idea is that we're working from a relatively more general level of interest to a relatively more specific levels of interest. In the case of the MMPI-2 RF, we're working from the validity scales to the substantive scales to the so-called other scales on the test. And again, this is similar to other approaches to test interpretation that I've tried to teach, and it's consistent with Ben Porath's book, Interpretation of the MMPI-2 RF, and the manual for administration scoring and interpretation that ships with the test itself. So for instance, if you have, you know, some hundreds or thousands of dollars burning a hole in your pocket or in your bank account, you could order, if you're licensed as a psychologist, the MMPI-2 RF and that blue book there at the back, you can see I've put an arrow on it. That's the manual for how to administer, score, and interpret the test. So again, my approach, uh, you know, borrowing and, and adapting from these sources is to teach these successive levels of interpretation. In the case of the MMPI-2 RF, we're beginning first at the level of protocol validity. We're looking at the scales which give us information about whether or not the whole test is likely to be valid, that is to say a, an accurate measure for this particular client, or it's likely to be invalid. And that's important because if we have s uh, significant questions about the validity of the protocol, that is to say the validity of the whole test, then we might not bother to do much other interpretation. We might just stop. Um, assuming we can satisfy our concerns about the potential uh, invalidity of the test, you know, we find that this, this protocol is likely to be valid, then we move on to the substantive scales, which themselves are kind of organized hierarchically from more general to more specific, looking at broad areas of concern, clinical scales, and then specific problem scales. And then if we really want to, or if you know, it's appropriate for the client or the referral question, we might go on and talk about some of the other scales, including the personality pathology scales, or maybe even the interest scales. So it's kind of like this stepping down or hierarchical approach that I hope is kind of similar to what you've learned if you've watched my videos for other test interpretation. Now, Pearson Psychor, the, the publishing company uh, that, that publishes the MMPI-2 tests, um, has a different options for scoring. They actually have mail-in scoring, or I think even 
facts in scoring where you could, if you were in practice, you could package up a particular test protocol, you know, the answer sheet for your client and mail it to them, or I think fax it to them. What's more commonly done, I think nowadays, if you're in practice, is you use either software which you buy from them and install on your local computer, or you use their online uh, portal where you can upload uh, answers that your um, that your client has given on the test protocol on the answer sheet, and then you get automated scoring. And there are actually a couple, a couple of different levels of interpretation that you can purchase in terms of how much money you want to spend. One is a relatively straightforward scoring uh, scoring report, and the other is a more elaborate interpretive report. And I'll, I'll talk about the distinction between those a little bit later. But suffice it to say, um, you can and you probably should use the software. It is technically possible to score an MMPI2 RF by hand, but it is very laborious and probably rather error prone. And um, you probably have better things to do with your time. So you're probably using one of their scoring services. Just a reminder here, yeah, anytime we think about testing, we have to think about ethics. And in the case of the MMPI 2 RF, like pretty much any other test, we have to remember uh, ethical standard 9.01, which is the basis for assessment standard, just reminding us if we're making an assessment, what we really need to do is consider multiple sources of information. That could be multiple tests or a test like the MMPI-2 RF and a clinical interview and the report of you know, family members or, or colleagues. Um, and we have to make sure that that information is integrated in some way that's appropriate to the client's uh, or the test taker's present presentation and his or her concerns. We don't just give one test, the MMPI-2 RF, and say, well, that's it, that's all, assessment is complete. That's irresponsible, that's unethical. Also, we should remember Ethical Standard 9.09, .09, and this is the one that covers using test scoring and interpretation services, because in the case of the MMPI-2 RF, we're almost certainly going to be using one of these scoring and interpretation services. We have to select one that's based on the competence of the test interpreter, that's appropriate and provides valid empirically supported interpretations. In the case of working with the, the test publisher, um, that's less of a problem because they're the authority on their test. They do an enormous amount of psychometric research on their own test. So you could find, I'm sure, on the internet other sources, uh, other websites that would advertise test scoring and interpretation for the MMPI-2 or the MMPI-2 RF. Maybe some of them are good, uh, maybe some of them aren't. It's hard to know for sure. I mean, gosh, I didn't include slides on this in this lecture because the lecture is already ridiculously long, but do this for yourself, you know, for your own amusement. Uh, type in MMPI2 into your search engine and you'll find a lot of websites where people are just giving information about this test or offering to give you the test online for free or, uh, or, or so on and so on. So there's a lot of probably bad information out there. And it's your responsibility as a, as a professional uh, to choose the right source to do your scoring and interpretation. And if you choose Pearson PsychOR, um, that's the right choice. And I say that having no real investment in <laughs> the success of their company. I don't get employed by them. I don't own stock in the company. Um, more importantly, perhaps, is when you use their scoring service, don't just cut and paste from the interpretive or scored report that you get. It's your responsibility to read that information, think how well it applies to your particular client, and using your best judgment, include or not include those uh, bits of scoring or those bits of interpretation in your assessment report. You're ultimately the guy or the girl, the, the person who is responsible for that report, not, oh gee, Pearson says that you have this problem, therefore you must. No, it's on you as the professional. So like I've said already a couple times, you kind of need the software. It's fairly difficult to do calculations by hand. Technically, you can do it. Uh, I certainly wouldn't recommend it, but you're probably going to need the scoring service. So all right, with all that stuff out of the way, let's take a quick overview of the topics I'm going to try and cover today. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about completing the record form. I'm going to talk a little bit about some suggestions for basic interpretation. So we begin, of course, with completing the record form. And as I've tried to explain when talking about interpreting other tests that I've covered in this semester, uh, this is an important step. Don't skip important information um, on the record form, because if you do, you could get into a, a, a situation where you've missed information which you might later on need. 
So in the case of the MMPI2 RF, on the front page of the record form, the, the form that the, uh, the client or the test taker fills out, um, there's a space to provide an identification number, um, a birth date, a gender, and a test date. That's all important. There's a back page where you can uh, uh, provide some optional information like the name, the person's years of education, their marital status, and their ethnic or, uh, origin. Um, there's also an area where you can provide information about the norm group that you want to use when scoring uh, this test. Now this test, uh, when, when we talk about interpreting the test, we talk about comparing the individual test takers' responses to the general uh, standardization sample that was used for MMPI2 RF, and we can also compare his or her responses to a particular uh, subsample or, or subpopulation of folks like male adult psychiatric inpatients or female uh, outpatients uh, or so on and so on and so on. And those subgroups or subpopulations, however you, you know, define them, may be really important depending on the type of test interpretation that you want to do. It's probably the best to compare your client to um, a corresponding uh, norm group that's appropriate for him or for her. You know, if you're seeing a, an adult female in an outpatient setting, you probably want to compare her responses to those of other adult females in outpatient populations. Hopefully that's pretty straightforward. So again, uh, the import or an important point here, the important point is uh, don't forget to complete this information. It's really important, especially um, identifying information. You know, don't miss out on that because then you have a mysterious protocol and you don't know who it matches to. And choosing the correct norm group, that's important for your interpretation. If you use the scoring service or one of the different options for scoring, you basically send this information to Pearson SciCorps and they um, integrate it along with any narrative information you provide and send you back a sample report or a sample and in interpret, you know, a sample scoring report or a sample interpretive report. Either way, it begins with a header that provides a little bit of description for the client. Here, the person we're working with and this is a fictitious client, um, is a 46-year-old married man admitted for inpatient treatment after presenting with psychotic uh, thinking and assaultive behaviors. So you get a little bit of a sense of this guy's presentation and background. Now beyond that, when we look at this record form, what have we got? Well, we've got individual items. Those are the individual questions that the person answered. Uh, and they're answering them each true or false. They're items corresponding to different symptoms or attitudes or beliefs. And we have raw scores for different scales, which are just the sums of the items that, are, that go into or make up that particular scale. And so, uh, you know, you probably don't do this by hand, but what the software is doing for you, whether it's local or uh, online, is it's adding up different groups of items of uh, responses to create raw scores for different scales, raw scale, um, uh, raw scale scores. Most of the scales on the MMPI are then transformed using a process called standard linear uh, T-score transformation, which is basically like a T-score transformation, except um, there's a little bit of a correction to normalize, uh, uh, that is to say, to make less skewed the distributions of responses for uh, those particular scales. So again, this is for most, for our purposes, mostly just like a regular old T-score, uh, meaning there's going to be a mean of 50 and a standard deviation of 10, um, which makes it easier to compare different scale score elevations. So you compare someone's elevation on one scale to their elevation on another. If those, uh, if what you're comparing are these uh, standard linear T-scores, then you get a, uh, an easier comparison than if they were just the raw scores for those particular scales, because different scales are made up of different numbers of items, making it difficult or even impossible to compare them one to the other. Um, and if this sounds familiar to you, and hopefully it does, this is basically similar to the process of the SCL90R and indeed many other uh, psychological tests where you take raw scores, you transform them, and you often represent them as T-scores just because those are familiar to most clinicians and can be fairly easily interpreted. So again, the MMPI-2 RF has a lot of scales on it, 51 if I think I got that count correct. That's a ton of information. How do you make sense of all of this? How do you work with all of this? Well, I've got some suggestions for basic interpretation.
And as I've already said, we're working um, in different steps from the protocol validity scales down to the substantive scales down to the other scales. So let's first consider protocol validity scales. And why are we considering these validity scales? What's so important about them? Well, let's remember that all measurements involve some amount of error. There are different uh, sources of measurement and error. And in the case of uh, self-report measures, one source of potential error is um, clients poor responding. When clients are responding in ways that misrepresent how they really feel, think, or behave. And there are all sorts of ways that clients can do this or test takers can do this. Um, they may be unintentional, uh, so someone may be merely just confused uh, by the questions and they're responding in a way that is um, uh, error prone for them. Or there could be intentional uh, patterns of responding uh, that are problematic and misrepresentative. So a client might be uh, intentionally trying to fake good, make themselves look uh, less disordered and more functional than they really are. Or they might be trying to fake bad for all sorts of uh, reasons. The validity scales help us to know if clients are misrepresenting themselves, not necessarily uh, knowing uh, whether they're doing it unintentionally or intentionally, although we may be able to make a guess at that a little bit. And they also help us determine if or how to interpret the rest of the scales on the instrument. Like I said before, um, if it's the case that a client is really um, haphazardly uh, answering questions or answering questions in a way that's that's uh, highly misrepresentative, we might at an extreme decide not to even bother with any further interpretation of the MMPI2 RF because we're sufficiently suspicious about the quality of the answers we're getting to think that maybe these other scales are kind of meaningless or at least they have meaning which is very difficult to discern. So we like these validity scales, they're potentially very useful to us and there are an awful lot of them. You can see here we've got VRIN, TRIN, FR, FPR, FS, FBS, R, L, R, and KR. And I'll, I'll talk about these all in a bit. You can see my little uh, answers or my little definitions for each of them up there on the screen. Um, that's a lot. And I think any test user might be a little bit daunted faced with all these invalidity skills thinking, gosh, what can this all mean? The suggestion that I would make to you and that books uh, like Ben Porath's books will make is to organize them into areas. And the areas of validity concern where we have are content non-responsiveness, which involves the cannot say scale and the Vrin and Trin scales, over-reporting, that's making yourself look worse than maybe you really are, that's the various F scales, and under-reporting, that's making yourself seem maybe a little bit better off, less sick, more well, more functional than you really are. Those are the L and K scales. We take all that welter of different information and we organize it into groups. So let's first consider those scales in the content non-responsiveness group. First one we have is the cannot say scale. And, and for what it's worth, this is actually not usually represented as a T-score, um, unlike some of the other scales on the test. Um, rather, what it is, is just a count of items out of the full 338 items that are on the test that were skipped, or that were answered both true and false. So if you skip a question, or if you screw, uh, circle in or sort of darken in both the true and false response for a particular item, that's counted as a cannot say item, as if you, know, you couldn't say what your answer was to that question. So how do we interpret the cannot say scale? Well, uh, we look to see if in total 15 or more items are skipped. And if that's the case, then uh, we start to worry about the validity of the overall protocol. So if it's the case that cannot say is 17, 18, 20, you know, they're skipping you know, fairly large numbers of items, uh, test takers skipping fairly large numbers of items on the test, then we worry about the possibility of interpreting uh, the test itself. Now, why might someone skip items on the MMPI2 RF? Well, there are probably a lot of different reasons. Those might include things like reading or language limitations. You know, the person's having trouble understanding questions or understanding how they're supposed to respond to those questions. Uh, it might be a kind of a, an obsessiveness. You know, they're they're very uh, anxious and they want to make sure they answer correctly. And so, out of out of uh, anxiety or frustration, they skip questions which they're not sure about or double answer questions that they're not sure about. 
or the client might be uncooperative, like he or she might be deliberately skipping or double answering so as to confuse the test uh, administrator. Um, different reasons, hard to know uh, right off the bat which one is the most likely, but certainly if for whatever reason lots of items are skipped, we start to worry about the validity of the overall protocol. Um, what do we do about this? Well, we can examine the items that are skipped for themes. You know, the scoring software will highlight the items that were skipped and you can look down uh, across them and, and see, you know, perhaps it's the case that the client tends to skip items which have to do with drug use or with sexual uh, interests. And so you might note that in your report and that might be uh, clinically relevant uh, for your assessment. It's also the case that the scoring software will highlight the scales in which 90% or less of the items have been responded to. So you, know, you can, might imagine you've administered the MMPI to, to a client and he has skipped a number of items and it's the case that many of those items are the items which load onto, let's say, the cynicism scale which is um, uh, the RC scale three for what that's worth. Now, knowing that, or rather the software telling you that makes you then concerned about interpreting that scale in particular. You might be okay to interpret the other scales which have all or, or most of their items responded to, but not that one scale because for that one scale, there's a limited amount of information. So the software is really helpful in that respect. So looking for themes and also highlighting um, scales that are missing lots of their items, scales that suffered a lot of skips. You, you're, less, um, you're less confident in interpreting them, especially interpreting lack of elevation. So uh, you, you might observe like, oh wow, you know, this person has a very low level of cynicism. Well, it might be that they have a low level of cynicism, but it might be also that they just skipped a lot of the items which would have otherwise added into their score for cynicism. So you have to be a bit uh, careful about that. You look at that. So if the cannot say scale elevates, but doesn't elevate above 15, you know, if it's in the range of, let's say one to 14, um, the scores on some of the scales may be invalid. Um, and again, we might worry particularly about selective non-responding. The person isn't skipping lots and lots of items. They're skipping a small number of items. Maybe especially they're skipping items in a particular area selectively. Um, so again, we might examine uh, these skips for themes. We might uh, look to see if the scoring software gives us notes about particular scales uh, suffering from skips more so than other scales. Um, it's not always the case that if someone elevates, uh, can't say a lot, you know, above 15, that they're skipping, you know, in a kind of a non-deliberate way, just kind of randomly. But if they elevate a little bit, it's more selective or specific, but certainly it is the case that either way, whether it's an elevation above 15 or an elevation, say, up to 15, up to 14. Uh, we either way want to be looking for themes and looking for ind indication that particular scales are suffering, especially from being skipped or cannot say responded to. So once we've moved beyond uh, the cannot say scale, we can take a look at the variable response inconsistency scale or VRIN scale. This scale is based on 53 pairs of items and the members of each pair have similar content. So the responses to each pair should be consistent. So you should be responding to one uh, item in each pair the same way you responded to the other item. If you're not, if you're responding inconsistently, like lots of pairs of true falses or false trues, those add up to your, uh, those elevate your score on the VRIN scale, or those, those elevate the score on the test taker's VRIN scale. So how do we interpret VRIN? Well, we look for elevations above 80. Um, and if the elevations above 80, if the elevation is at or above 80, then probably the prof profile is invalid. Um, possible reasons for this again could be things like uh, reading or language problems. There could be errors in recording or scoring the responses. Maybe you or your, uh, if you have an assistant who's working with you, maybe you made a mistake in uh, uploading this information to the scoring software or copying it to the scoring software. It also could be the case that there's a pattern of uncooperative or random responding. Um, VRIN doesn't prove that the person is deliberately uh, uh, being non-responsive, but it has maybe a bit of suspicion about that, or it adds a little bit of suspicion that maybe this person is in some way being inconsistent in their responding, and it might be kind of deliberate. Like they, 
you know, they answer one question one way and then later down the line they answer another question another way deliberately just to, to mess with you, the test administrator, perhaps. Well, what do you do about this if the profile, uh, I'm sorry, if the VRIN scale is elevated at or above 80? Um, well, you do nothing because probably the whole test should not be interpreted at this point. And when you're writing your assessment report, you might note, you know, the, uh, the test takers' responses were highly inconsistent, uh, making the validity of the rest of the test or the profile that the test yielded, um, uh, you know, uh, sus uh, of, sus of suspect validity or unusable or so on and so on. Okay, well, what do you do if the Vrin scale elevates, but it doesn't elevate above or at or above 80? Let's say it elevates in the range of T-score 70 to T-score 79. Well, here there's some evidence for inconsistent responding. And again, it's possible that there were reading or language problems or errors in recording. Um, it's maybe somewhat less likely that the person was being deliberately uncooperative or engaging in deliberate random responding. Um, and it's also possible that, uh, the, that we can still interpret the rest of the profile from the test or the, from the protocol. So it's um, the person is answering somewhat inconsistently, but not so inconsistently as to make us think that they're deliberately being uh, inconsistent or that they are deliberately responding in a random fashion across items on the protocol. Uh, so, you know, there's something there to worry about, and we shouldn't make our interpretations cautiously, but we can perhaps proceed. Along with VRIN, we have another type of validity scale that is the true response inconsistency, or TRIN scale. This is based on responses to pairs of 20, or I'm sorry, 26 pairs of items. The members of each pair have similar content, but the direction uh, of endorsement is reversed. So if you respond true to one member of a pair, you really should, to be consistent, respond false to the other member of the pair, or vice versa. And how TRIN works is it you know, scores of pairs that are true trues or false falses add up in a direction, uh, add up to elevate the trend score. Moreover, um, the profile scoring report will will tag whether the person is tending to true true trend more or they're tending to false false trend more because maybe that's kind of important or interesting to look at. So what do you do in terms of interpreting TRIN? Well, a bit like with VRIN, if the uh, T-score for this scale is 80 or above, then the profile is almost certainly invalid. Um, why might it be that way? Well, it's probably due to uncooperativeness. Um, note here that <coughs> elevation of TRIN is more suggestive of deliberate inconsistent responding than elevation of VRIN. In order to elevate TRIN, it's not for absolute certain, but it's more likely that you have to kind of try to be inconsistent. Uh, and maybe a client is doing that uh, on purpose. We can't be entirely certain, but it is suspicious. And in either case, if TRIN, or in any case, I should say, if TRIN is elevated to 80 or above, we probably do nothing with the rest of the profile. We don't interpret it. The protocol is considered almost certainly invalid. Okay, well, what about if TRIN elevates, but it doesn't quite get up to 80? What if it's kind of in the range of 60 uh, to 70, or I'm sorry, 70 to 79? Well, here there's some evidence of inconsistency, and it's possible that the person is being uncooperative. And what we do about that is we should probably be cautious about interpreting the rest of the profile that the protocol has given us. And we might also note the direction of the elevation. So is the person true, true responding a lot or are they false, false responding a lot? That may reflect something like uh, a yay saying or a nay saying bias in responding. So an important point to make here is that inconsistent responding makes scales hard or even difficult or even impossible to interpret. So that what we're trying to assess here is is the person being generally inconsistent in how they answer questions. Uh, the assumption is that not only are they being inconsistent on the items that make up the Vrin scale or the Trin scale, but in general across the whole protocol. Um, and so Vrin and Trin are really useful in trying to detect this behavior. And as I noted on the previous slide or the slide um, before that, Trin is somewhat more consistent with deliberate inconsistent responding than is Vrin. Although to be clear, n none of these scales are like you know, lie detectors or mind reading. They're just giving us suggestions.
So if we wanted to try and represent this picture graphically, we might say there, there are these set of questions that we're asking and answering when we consider content non-responsiveness uh, as a validity, as, as a group of validity scales. You know, is the client responding enough? Is the client responding, but responding inconsistently? And are they maybe responding inconsistently in a deliberate way? Well, the first question we can answer with the cannot say scale. And as I noted before, if it elevates above or above 15, we probably just stop interpretation. If it elevates somewhat less than 15, we note themes and we are careful about scales in which 90% or I'm sorry, less than 90% of the items have been responded to. Assuming that cannot say doesn't elevate massively, we ask, you know, is the client responding inconsistently? And here we look first at Vryn. And again, if there's a high elevation in Vryn, we probably just stop. But if Vryn is elevated, but not very high, we maybe look for themes if we can. Is it, are there particular areas of inconsistent responding? And if, uh, if this is, if, or in any case, you know, whether there are themes or not, uh, we proceed cautiously with our interpretation of the rest of the profile from the protocol. And then the last question is, is this client maybe uh, responding inconsistently in a deliberate fashion? And here we focus more on trend. And again, if it elevates very high at or above 80, we just stop the protocol interpretation. Um, and if it elevates but not quite up to 80, we probably proceed again noting themes and being careful or cautious about the rest of our interpretation of the other skills on the profile that the protocol has given us. So again, Content non-responsiveness, we've got some different sources of information. Now let's move on to over-reporting. For the over-reporting uh, scales, there are a number of them. The first one we're going to look at is the infrequent responses, or F scale. This is based on 32 items, which, uh, of which members of the normative sample rarely endorse. So items that most people tend to rarely endorse experiences, thoughts, feelings, etc. that most people uh, don't do. Um, and so if you as the, or if the test taker, I should say, answers a lot of these, then maybe, well, certainly he or she is endorsing items that are atypically endorsed in a normal group of folks. Uh, maybe that means that your client or your test taker is faking bad. That's sometimes called the F scale, the faking scale, although it's probably a bad habit because it implies a certain judgment that we're not always sure of. Um, it's also worth noting that sometimes F scale can elevate just because the client is very, very distressed and they're endorsing a lot of different experiences that are pretty unusual, unusual for normal folks or folks who aren't experiencing high levels of distress. So when we look at the F scale, if um, F elevates very high, if it elevates to 120, then the profile is almost certainly invalid. This is consistent with over, um, with inconsistent responding and especially with over responding. So if you respond very inconsistently across the whole profile, kind of like Vryn and Trin inconsistently, that can lead to elevations in the F scale. Um, but you can also get elevations in the F scale if you're over reporting. So as you might guess from what I just said, one thing we do when we're interpreting the F scale is we look back at the Vryn and Trin scale to see if we have evidence that this client, this test taker, is generally responding in an inconsistent way. And if, you know, if he or she is, then we suspect that the reason that the F scale is elevated may be at least in part due to inconsistent responding. Um, if not, then we think, well, maybe it's just due to over responding or over reporting. Um, in any case, we probably don't proceed much further. We might uh, note that this client is endorsing unusual experiences, that this may be associated with distress, or it may be also associated with over-reporting of symptoms. And we probably don't go on to interpret the uh, substantive scales on the MMPI2RF because they'll all be over-elevated because it seems that this client or this test taker is tending to over-endorse items. So infrequent responding, um, if the person elevates uh, above 120, then it's almost certainly <coughs> invalid. If the profile is in the range of 100 to 119, it's probably invalid. If it's in the level of 79 to 99, it's possibly invalid. And this is maybe a little bit more consistent with over-reporting. So again, possible reasons. Um, in valid responding, there could be higher rates. Uh, the higher the rate of uh, 
or I'm sorry, the higher the level of the F scale, the higher the elevation, the more likely it is that what we're looking at with this test taker or this client is inconsistent responding or over reporting. However, um, it could also be severe psychopathology. It could also be the case um, that the person is just really in a lot of acute distress and are kind of he or she is pinging all the all the bells on the test, so to speak. So uh, again, I'm kind of repeating myself deliberately in this lecture. What we do is we look at the Vernon trend scales to get a sense of how likely this is to, uh, how likely the elevation of F is to be related to inconsistent responding. Um, if the elevation is very, very high, you know, in the range of like 100 to, uh, especially if it's over 120, then it's probably due to over-reporting. If it's not quite that high, and if there isn't evidence of inconsistent responding, then maybe what we're looking at is someone suffering from severe uh, psychopathology or some other reason for being severely distressed. At the risk of you know further repeating myself, an important point to take here is that inconsistent responding can lead to elevations in various scales. So if someone is responding just inconsistently across the protocol for whatever reason, it's going to distort elevations of scales. And it can, in some cases, make the client look more sick than he or she really is i.e. it can elevate the F scale. And a key that we keep on going back to, <coughs> pardon me, again and again is the use of the Vernon trend scales to try and rule out inconsistent responding. Um, um, if Vernon trend uh, are, uh, you know, if Vernon trend are not elevated, um, then it's probably not inconsistent responding. If you look at the Vernon trend scales and they're not particularly elevated, then this client, uh, his or her elevation in the F scale is probably not due to inconsistent responding. So it probably is due to over-reporting, i.e. faking, to use that bad word, or maybe real distress. Another important point here. Um, when we think, try and decide, is it over-reporting or is it real distress, the general idea is that very high F scores suggest over-reporting. So even people who are very distressed, legitimately distressed, don't tend to elevate F an awful lot because those items are just really unusual. They're rare, even among people who are very distressed. Um, if F is somewhat elevated, it maybe is more a case of someone being distressed but not over-reporting. And we can never be totally sure about this. I mean, to be clear, this, these are just suggestions made on patterns of observed responses in the normative sample. So again, um, FR is based, or the regular F scale, I should say, is based on extreme items that are rarely uh, endorsed even by genuinely distressed people. And the same basic logic applies to the other F scales. So there's the FP scale, which is rarely endorsed by psychiatric folks in psychiatric populations. So unusual behaviors, unusual thoughts that are unusual even among people who have severe psychopathology. And the FS scales are uh, items uh, that are unusual. Uh, they're rarely endorsed even among people who have medical problems. And so the uh, FP and FS scales were kind of innovations for the MMPI-2 RF to make the test more usable, uh, make it uh, in different settings, like psychiatric settings, like medical settings. So let's take a look at the uh, FP scale first. Um, this, these are 21 items uh, that members of a normative sample with genuine psychopathology gen rarely endorse. So even among the overall, normative, the overall normative sample, even those people who had severe psychopathology, even they didn't commonly endorse lots of these items. Um, so why, why is that interesting to us? Well, it's less likely than the regular old F scale to be confounded with real psychological distress. So it might be the case that someone in real, just acute distress uh, elevates the F scale. That can happen. Uh, it's less likely that they're going to elevate the FP scale because these items on the FP scale are even unusual among people who are quite distressed because they have real and severe psychopathology. Um, so what do we do about this? Well, if the uh, scale for FP elevates at or above 100, the scale is probably invalid, again, because of maybe inconsistent responding or over-reporting of symptoms. 
What do we do? Well, at this point, you're probably super familiar with this general approach. We look at the Vrin and Trin scale to see if the person is responding inconsistently. Let's imagine that the test taker, the, the, the client, is not responding inconsistently. That rules out that possibility and makes us think more that the person is just over-reporting. But there may be specifically over-reporting symptoms that are like psychopathology, but they're unusual even among people who have real psychopathology. So maybe they're trying to fake bad, fake like they have a psychological or psychiatric disorder. Again, we can't be sure of that, but it's a, a suggestion or a suspicion that we might have. Um, if the elevation of the FP scale is so high, we don't interpret the rest of the scales on the test. We just stop there and maybe note in our assessment this pattern of responding. Well, if the FP scale elevates but doesn't elevate quite above 100, then maybe there's over-reporting or possibly there's over-reporting. Um, this could be severe psychopathology. Again, if it's elevated but not elevated super high, it's more, it's possible to be severe pathology, in this case, psychopathology. Um, we interpret this more or less the same way we do as the F scale. We look at Vrin and Trin to rule out um, inconsistent responding, and we note that the distress is unusual, but it may be related to severe psychopathology. The same overall approach applies to the FS scale. These are infrequent somatic responses or sort of medical responses, bodily problems. They're based on responses to 16 items that members of the normative sample with genuine medical problems rarely endorse. So physical sensations, aches, pains, etc., which are kind of like medical or somatic problems, but they're rarely endorsed by people who actually have real somatic problems. Um, and this was uh, you know, designed to help differentiate folks from quote-unquote uh, patients with real problems. Uh, the overall logic is kind of the same as we've seen before. If the scale elevates above or at or, at or above a t-score of 100, then the somatic scale may be, um, <clears throat> then the scales may be invalid, particularly the somatic scales of the test, those associated with medical or somatic problems. Again, why might this happen? Well, it could be because of inconsistent responding, or it could be over-reporting of somatic problems. What do we do about this? Well, we take a look at Vrin and Trin to, again, rule out the inconsistent responding hypothesis. And then we might note uh, that this distress is really unusual, even among people who have uh, medical or somatic problems. And we might be particularly cautious about interpreting the somatic scales of the test. So what do we do when the, or if the infrequent somatic responses, the FS scale elevates, but doesn't elevate really, really high? Well, this could be indicative of uh, over-reporting because of inconsistent responding, over-reporting of somatic problems or real se severe somatic problems. Um, how do we approach this question? Well, it's kind of like we've seen before. We look at Vrin and Trin to try to, if possible, rule out the whole inconsistent responding hypothesis. Then, to the extent that we can rule out inconsistent responding as FS gets higher, 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 especially above 100, it looks more like over-reporting. Uh, if it's high but not quite that high, then maybe it's real uh, severe semantic problems. One last scale, uh, I'm in this portion of the validity scales, that's the FBS uh, scale. Um, this is based on 30 items which are unusual combinations of somatic cognitive, I'm sorry, somatic and cognitive symptoms. It's designed to kind of complement the FS scale, and it has an interesting history. It was originally designed to assess non-credible symptom presentations in civil litigation. So if someone, uh, and it's commonly used by neuropsychologists, so if someone was um, trying to evaluate a client in a legal case who is uh, claiming to have an injury or a disability because of a workplace accident, uh, we want to know if this person's uh, likely reporting uh, truthfully about his or her symptoms or if they are selecting kind of odd combinations that, that to them seem like they should go along with these symptoms and they're kind of over-presenting or over-reporting them perhaps to, uh, to look sicker or more impaired than they really are. Well, the approach here hopefully is pretty obvious or pretty familiar by now. If the scale really elevates really high, then the protocol is probably invalid because of inconsistent responding or because of over-reporting of these odd cognitive slash somatic problems. 
And again, we just look at Vernon Trin to rule out the inconsistent responding hypothesis if we can. And um, if we can do that, then we note that the level of distress is unusual and we can probably proceed, but we have to interpret those cognitive and somatic scales there elsewhere on the instrument on the test pretty cautiously. And as we saw with the other scales, um, if the, uh, if the uh, scales elevate but they don't go quite as high as to be at or over 100, then maybe this is over-reporting that could be due to inconsistent responding, to over-reporting of somatic symptoms, or to real significant comorbid conditions. So again, we use Rin and Trin to try and rule out that possibility of inconsistent responding, and to the extent that FBS is elevated, but it's not massively elevated, we might at least wonder, like, perhaps this person is being truthful. He or she has these weird combinations of symptoms, but maybe it's because he or she really has uh, comorbid conditions which give him or give her those that, to us, seemingly odd combination of feelings and sensations, symptoms and signs, etc. So an important point here. Um, in general, with all these over-reporting scales, all these F scales, the scales can be elevated for three reasons. There can be over-reporting, there can be inconsistent reporting, and there can be real distress in one or more of these areas that I've discussed. And again, we use Vrin and Trin to hopefully, or maybe, help us rule out that inconsistent responding. And to the extent that we can do that, like let's imagine for a particular client, a particular test taker, we can rule out inconsistent responding. Then we just observe that very high elevations of scores suggest over-reporting and somewhat high elevations suggest real distress. Um, and again, that's assuming we can rule out inconsistent responding. And all of these are just suggestions. They're not proof. It's not a mind reader. It's not telling us for sure that the person's lying or that they're not lying. Or they're faking or they're not faking. If we try and represent this pictographically, we can, as we did before, think about a set of questions. Is the client over-reporting? Is the client over-reporting because of inconsistency? Or are they genuinely distressed? So for all of these scales, if it's very, very high elevation, we probably just stop. And maybe we note the general area in which this elevation is occurring. Uh, if it's not very, very high, we then look at Vrin and Trin to see if we can rule out inconsistency. If we can't rule out inconsistent responding, then we stop. But if we can see a modest elevation and we can rule out inconsistent responding, we might entertain the possibility that this person is genuinely distressed and maybe look for other evidence that in other assessments. You know, look at our notes from our clinical interview, look at other uh, information we have from the client's coworkers or family or friends and see if we get the presentation that, yeah, this person maybe does have comorbid uh, conditions or maybe he or she really is super distressed right now. And that could explain these elevations which are high but not massively high uh, and which are not apparently due to inconsistent or kind of random responding. Okay, so if you're still with me, <laughs> we're, we're just working our way through those validity scales on the MMPI-2RF, and we've already considered the content non-responsiveness group, and we've considered the over-reporting group. So we've got one more to go before we can get on with the rest of the test, and that's the under-reporting group. The good news is this one's, relatively speaking, shorter, or there are fewer tests involved. So content, uh, I'm sorry, uh, validity scales under-reporting, the first one we want to look at is the un common virtue or L scale. Um, this is based on responses to 14 items which are uh, involve um, endorsing which present uh, involve presenting yourself in an overly good light by denying minor but common shortcomings. So uh, if you know we all might answer one or two of these in the direction that seems a bit overly virtuous um, or overly rosy and good, but if you answer a lot of these in the direction of emphasizing these good qualities and denying these minor problems, then you may be, um, you may be, well you certainly, as the, the test taker, will certainly be elevating the L scale, and this may be consistent with lying, you know, the the, um, you know, the L scale is sometimes called the lie scale, but again, that's, a, that's probably a very bad habit because we don't know if someone's lying when they're doing this. It, it may be that they're just a really good person. And I put this little note in here for myself, you cynical jerk. Like, let's not just assume that someone is lying because they're uh, endorsing a lot of virtuous beliefs about themselves. But what do we do with this? Well, 
This will seem really familiar, I hope. Uh, we look at the L scale, and if it elevates very high, at or above 80, then the profile is probably invalid. Uh, why could this be? Well, again, it could be because of inconsistent responding. Without meaning to, or at least without meaning to make one's, uh, the without the test taker meaning to make himself or herself look overly virtuous, it might just be the case that through random responding or inconsistent responding, he or she elevated the L scale. Um, it could also be because of deliberate underreporting of pathology, uh, underreporting uh, sickness or illness, denying problems. Well, what do you do? Well, like you saw with the uh, like you saw with the overreporting scales, we want to always look back at Vrin and Trin to see if inconsistent responding plays a role in the elevation of the L scale, or at least if it could plausibly have played a role in the elevation of the L scale. Um, assuming that it hasn't, if Vrin and Trin are not elevated, we might then look at the person and we might say, well they're noting a level of virtue that's uncommon and it's possible then that the elevations of their clinical skills may be underestimations of their true pathology. So we don't necessarily have to stop interpretation of the rest of the profile or you know that comes from the protocol but we have to be very cautious about it because uh, any other information we get about pathology from our clinical scales which are part of the substantive scales group those could be underestimations. Of course, L scale could elevate but not quite get up to 80, and this just gives us gradations or shades of possible <coughs> underreporting, which again um, could be because of inconsistent responding, it could be because of underreporting, or it could be because of traditional upbringing. This is an interesting one because, at least according to the interpretive manuals that I'm familiar with, um, it is argued that if you have a very conservative, kind of a traditional in the, I don't know, uh, you know, gender roles and kind of uh, uh, sort of Judeo-Christian values sense of traditional upbringing in America, then um, it's possible that that can lead to elevations in the L scale that are not uh, specifically the result of underreporting. Although, as I note here, I just recently stumbled across an article that argues that there's not a lot of evidence for this bit of clinical lore or intuition for this interpretation. So, in a way, I'm just throwing that in there now to, to illustrate that uh, with the MMPI, because it's such a big and such a widely used instrument, our understanding of it is constantly constantly evolving. Um, the, maybe a more important point to dwell upon here is that the higher the L is, the higher or the closer it gets to 80 or even above 80, the more likely it is that we're looking at something like inconsistent responding or under-reporting as compared to traditional upbringing or real true virtue. So again, uh, we look back at Vernon Trin and assuming that inconsistent responding can be ruled out as a hypothesis, we might note that this person um, has uh, is endorsing an uncommon level of virtue, um, but this may be uh, occur because of traditional upbringing, and maybe the clinical scales are going to be underestimates. So these are notes we make to ourselves, or maybe points that we factor in to our uh, assessment when we write up the results of the protocol. Along with the L scale, we have a scale called the Adjustment Validity Scale, or the K scale. Um, and this is based on the responses of 14 items that involve presenting yourself as being highly adjusted in kind of an old school psychotherapeutic sense. Like if you're a well-adjusted person, you've overcome your various sort of uh, psychodevelopmental and neurotic conflicts, and you're kind of pretty, you know, well presented. You don't have a lot of uh, negative emotions. You, don't have a, uh, a, you have a normal amount of positive emotions. You're well put together. Um, you can think of this maybe as a more sophisticated form of lying. You're presenting yourself as overly good, but it's less about kind of being virtuous and more about being psychologically well adjusted. So whether that means it's, whether that constitutes being more sophisticated or not, I suppose, is a matter of personal opinion. But it's a slightly different type or different shade or, or gradation of potentially uh, under reporting, of minimizing problems. Or, or you know maximizing virtues and minimizing problems. So just like we saw with the uh, with the L scale, or indeed with all the other scales, pretty much that we've talked, covered so far, um, if the elevation is very high, in this case it's above at or above 70, then what we've got is possible underreporting of symptoms, um, which could be again because of inconsistent responding or deliberate underreporting. And so again, we look at Vrin and Trin to rule out, if we can, inconsistent responding. And assuming we can rule out inconsistent responding, we can note in our notes to ourselves or in our assessment that we write up that this level of good adjustment that this client is is um, is uh, indicating is unusual. 
Um, and again, a bit like with the L scale, elevations in the substantive clinical scales may be underestimations of real pathology. So the idea is this person is presenting himself or herself, this test taker is presenting himself or herself as, as overly well adjusted, uh, even keeled, balanced as a person on the items that correspond to the K scale or the add into the K scale, assuming that he or she is doing the same thing across all the other items on, on the instrument, on the protocol, then it's likely that those clinical scales are going to be under estimates or under shots for how really depressed or really anxious the person is. And as we've seen with all these other scales, uh, there can be elevations which are high but are not quite at our threshold. In the case of the K scale, it's 70, um, which just are different sort of gradations or, or layers of possible under reporting. Um, which can be due to inconsistent responding, it can be due to underreporting, or it can be due to good psychological adjustment. This could, person could, this test taker could really just be a fairly psychologically healthy person. So again, what we want to do is look at Vernon Trin to rule out, if we can, inconsistent responding, and then to the extent that we can rule that out, if K is still elevated, if that elevation is really high, then maybe that looks a little bit more like deliberate underreporting sophisticated lying if you want to use a very loaded and probably not very nice term. But if it's elevated but not really elevated, maybe the person just is fairly psychologically healthy. We would make a note of that if we, if we wanted to in our notes or in our report. Okay, so the important point again, and I, I know I'm being repetitious here, but that's actually deliberate. You know, I want to kind of make sure all this stuff uh, is, um, you know, is learnable by you, you, you get it, you learn it, you internalize it, because I know it's a lot, is that inconsistent responding can lead to elevations in scales. In the case of the uh, L scale and the K scale, it can make the person look overly virtuous or good or healthy um, just if the person is inconsistently responding. If they're not deliberately trying to, to under-report or to fake good or to lie about how good they are, um, just inconsistent responding can lead to this. So we keep on looking back at Vrin and Trin to rule this stuff out if we can. Now, if it's not inconsistent responding, then elevations of L or elevations of K probably are uh, under-reporting or real goodness. But again, asterisk here is important. We can't be totally sure. These are just suggestions that we have to consider when comparing our, the, our notes and thinking about the results of this particular um, test uh, and the notes and, and test results we have for the other aspects of the assessment that we've done for this particular client. So let's try and represent this pictographically. Again, we've got a set of questions. Is the client under-reporting? Is the client responding inconsistently and maybe that's what's making it look like they're under-reporting? Or is it the case that the client is genuinely good or well-adjusted? Well, we look at the L and K scales and if they're very high, we stop interpretation. If they're high, but not very, very high, maybe we proceed, but we proceed provided that we can use Vrin and Trin to rule out the inconsistent responding. And let's say that the elevations of L or K are high, but not very, very high. And let's say that Vrin and Trin are not particularly elevated, then maybe this person is a genuinely good person, or at least thinks of themselves in that way. Um, or maybe they are genuinely well adjusted, or again, they at least think of themselves as being well adjusted. And you might want to look for other evidence, you know, look at your notes from your clinical interview, look at other test results, and so on, and so on. So if we put this all together, we've got all these different scales from the validity uh, scales, the validity area of, of the test, and we can organize them into these three groups, and we can use them to ask and answer important questions that bear upon how interpretable the test is. So let's take a look here at a uh, uh, profile for our client. Um, he is, again, a, a male. He's presenting for psychiatric treatment. So we've got his comparison to the overall group, and we've got his comparison uh, in the dotted line uh, to his psychiatric inpatient group. And you can see here that um, on the cannot say scale, he's elevated to 17. That's high. So he's skipped or double answered a lot of items. Um, there's not a lot of indication of inconsistent responding, so whether we compare him to the overall population or we compare him to a kind of a subpopulation of psychiatric male inpatients, he's not particularly elevating Vrin or Trin, although you can see here, I, I think, if you squint, for the Trin scale, that to the extent that he is inconsistently responding or trinning, he's doing so in the true direction. So maybe he's got a slight acquiescence bias or a yay-saying bias. 
I probably wouldn't make much of that because it's not much of an elevation. Um, we'd want to know at this point which items this client is not responding to because that seems to be the most interesting thing uh, about um, his content non-responsiveness scales. Um, there don't seem to be a lot of problems with over-reporting. It is true that he's elevated somewhat uh, the F scale. It's not very, very high though. And given that this person isn't inconsistently responding, we don't think, and given that he's presenting for psychiatric uh, treatment and has a history of psychotic and aggressive problems, it's possible that he's just legitimately quite distressed. You see here his F scale is quite elevated, but the FP scale is not particularly elevated. So if we compare him to other psychiatric patients, it's not particularly elevated. And we don't seem to have a lot of problems with underreporting. You know, his F, um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, his L and his K scales are not particularly elevated at all. So the big thing here is he's doing cannot, he's cannot saying uh, for a number of items, more so than we're really all that comfortable with. So what are these items he's not responding to? Well, depending on the type of report you purchase from uh, Pearson and Psychor, you'll get a uh, commentary on his uh, cannot say responses. So here we see the client, uh, or I'm sorry, the test taker answered less than 90% of the items on the following scales. So on the scale that go to symptom validity, FBS, adjustment K, cynicism, that's RC3, and aesthetic interests, um, uh, uh, that's uh, AES, he's responding to less than 90% of those items. So his cynicism scale, he's responding to less than half of the items that go onto that scale. To the extent that we proceed in our interpretation, we want to be really careful about interpreting that one scale because there's just not enough information there. Um, you also see here that um, there's commentary saying that he's, uh, he's responded in a fairly consistent manner, uh, that there's not a lot of indication of over-reporting, not a lot of indication of under-reporting. Um, we look at those unscorable responses, those ones that he skipped or, or double answered, and because this is a sample report, we don't see what those items actually are. We just see what scales they let they load onto. If this was a, a real report that you'd purchased, you actually would see the text of those items there, uh, and that would help you look for themes. Uh, we already know that something that those items on RC3 are the ones that are being most often skipped or double answered. So we know that ahead of time, but we might want to particularly look at those items to see what's really going on there if there's a theme that emerges. So on the real scored report you'd be able to look at the item content here for reasons of test security because the, I got this from the internet they're not allowing us to do that. So let's uh, let's kind of uh, you know uh, summarize here uh, or maybe make an important point here spend some time with these validity scales Lord knows I have I mean we're clocking in over an hour here and I've just talked about the very beginning of the MMPI. If you're unfamiliar with this test, you might be thinking, gosh, why is he spending so much time talking about just these scales? Well, they help you learn something about your client. They can help you understand, is your client confused? Is he uncooperative? Is he really distressed? Is he or she you know, really good or virtuous? You get some overall impressions if you're lucky and if you're perceptive when you just look at these scales. And importantly, they tell you how to plan the rest of your interpretation of all the other scales, particularly the substantive scales on this test. And in an extreme, if it's the case that there just uh, are all sorts of validity problems, we might stop interpretation, not even bother proceeding to some of those RC scales and other scales. Um, assuming that we don't stop right now, uh, we still might be rather cautious about how we proceed. In the case of this particular client, we might be particularly cautious if we wanted to make any sort of interpretation of the elevation of his RC scale because he's missing a lot of items there, just to use that example. Okay, so moving on, let's assume we've moved through protocol validity. We're fairly satisfied with the validity of this particular protocol. We think the profile can be interpreted. Now we're talking about the substantive scales, the higher order, the restructured clinical, and the specific problem scales. First off, the higher order scales. Well, these are derived using factor analysis, and they're designed to give us um, a sense of variation in three basic areas, emotions, thoughts, and behavior. And what we're looking at here is the general intensity of distress in this particular area. So again, these are represented by EID, THD, and BXD, um, corresponding to emotional and internalization problems, thought dysfunction, and behavioral and externalization dysfunctions. <laughs> 
If we look at the motion and internalization, internalization first, um, these are 41 items associated with emotional problems, low positive affect, high negative emotions, a sense of demoralization, feelings of anxiety and depression, and especially maybe being overwhelmed. Uh, if we look um, at how these elevations are interpreted, if the elevation is above 80, uh, at or above 80, there's considerable distress uh, in terms of emotional or internalization dysfunction, possibly some sort of acute crisis in this area. If the elevations are above 65, up to you know 80, um, then there's significant distress. And if they're below 40, um, then this person has better than average adjustments. So it's just interesting to note here that this is a scale that can be interpreted in the negative direction as well, if someone has very low levels of these problems. What do we do about this? Well. If we observe an elevation on this particular higher order scale, that's going to guide our attention towards corresponding clinical scales that have to do with emotional or internalization problems. Um, we might particularly want to look at evaluating the person for an internalizing disorder. Um, we might also note or expect that emotional difficulties could be a motivating factor for treatment. This person is feeling really upset and maybe that's something that we can harness to motivate them for treatment can help to describe the ways in which treatment could be beneficial for how bad they're feeling, making them feel better, let's hope. Thought dysfunctions up next. Thought dysfunctions based on 26 items that have to do with disordered thinking, like hallucinations, delusions, unrealistic thinking, and so on. The basic logic is the same here. If the score, um, if the T-score elevates to at or above 80, there's a serious, uh, there's you know, it's consistent with serious thought dysfunction. If it elevates above 65 and up to 80, there's probably significant thought problems or dysfunction. Um, what do you do? Well, again, this is guiding you to look at the restructured clinical scales that are particular to thought problems or psychotic features. Um, also, if we want to maybe evaluate the person uh, for antipsychotic medications and maybe note that they could require psychiatric inpatient treatment. The last of the higher order factors is behavioral or externalizing dysfunction. These are 23 items associated with behavioral problems like substance abuse, criminal behavior, abusive relationships, poor impulse control. The logic here is pretty similar to what we've seen before. 80 or above is a considerable or kind of crisis level behavioral problem, or at least it's consistent with that. Elevations of 65 up to 80, that's probably significant problems. And like the emotionalizing uh, higher order factor, this one, externalizing, uh, can be interpreted in the negative direction as well. So if the person has a score below 40, then they have uh, relatively more constraint than is typical, and they have very few problems in terms of their behavior. Uh, what's this let us do? Well, it guides us again to look at particular clinical scales, um, encourage us to, uh, encourages us to do further evaluation for externalizing your behavioral problems, and it also unfortunately may suggest to us that this person may be unmotivated or uncompliant with treatment. People who have a lot of behavioral problems may be very difficult to get involved in treatment. They may be resistant or oppositional, not necessarily, but it certainly is em empirically the case that that uh, it does happen. So as a clinician, we might be mindful of that in terms of planning how we present our treatment options to the client, how we try to motivate him or her to continue. So if we try and represent this stuff pictographically, we, we think with our higher order factors, what's the general area of the person's distress? You know, in a sense, where does it hurt? Is it uh, emotions and internalizing thoughts or behaviors and externalizing? We note the elevations if they are there. And we also note, as I've repeated, that um, yeah, emotions and internalizing and behavior and externalizing can be interpreted in the low or in the kind of negative or the deflected direction if, if such deflections exist. So here is the, uh, the scored uh, profile for our client. And you can see on the left his uh, elevations in the higher order factors. What do we see here? Well, looks like there's an elevation in uh, his behavioral and externalizing disorders higher order factor, at least as compared to the general population. So if you look at the darker of the lines, that is uh, elevated there. Um, the T-score is 68%. Um, so it looks like um, he's relatively more, uh, uh, has relatively uh, higher levels of externalizing uh, disorder uh, than is typical in the regular population, or at least he's answering questions that are consistent 
with the types of answers given by people who have elevated levels of these types of problems. It's interesting to note that as compared to a, a male um, uh, psychiatric inpatient uh, population, he isn't as elevated, or he's not particularly elevated at all. That's the dotted line. Um, you also can see here that his um, emotional or internalizing problems are deflected downwards, and probably not quite enough to be um, clinically significant. So it's not below a level of 40, but certainly a little bit lower than, uh, than is typical in the general population or in the uh, adult male psychiatric uh, population. So once you've looked at the higher order factors, you can move on and take a look at the uh, restructured uh, clinical scales. And these uh, were developed using principal component analysis, which is a technique similar to factor analysis. The reason this approach was used is it allowed the test makers to first pull out a major component associated with demoralization, like a general sense of how upset you are, removed you know, the variance associated with that component. And then from the remaining variance, uh, the test makers were able to construct non-overlapping scales, or scales made up of non-overlapping items that represent relatively broad areas of psychopathology. Meaning that you could look at these different areas, these different scales, and interpret them without uh, noting lots of elevations that have to necessarily go along with one another. These are scales made up of items that appear on only those scales and not on other restructured clinical scales. And you can see them here with their codes, and you can also see the names, and the names in brackets are kind of the old school names that date back to um, date back to MMPI-1 and MMPI-2. So for instance, RC7 is dysfunctional negative emotions, which used to be called psychasthenia, or is like what used to be called psychasthenia. All right, those are our restructured clinical scales. Um, just to kind of highlight, for a further highlight uh, what's going on here, we get one uh, first component that looks at demoralization. That's, uh, we can interpret that using our familiar, um, our familiar kind of uh, approach, which is a high elevation at or above 80 indicates significant distress, turmoil, unhappiness, maybe a crisis level of, of just being absolutely crushed by life. An elevation of 65 up to 80 it indicates feeling significantly sad, unhappy, hopeless, etc. And in the low direction, a deflection below 40 may indicate better than average life satisfaction. Lucky you if you feel that way. Um, what do we do about this? Well, certainly if someone elevates very high, we evaluate them for self-harm risk. Now, that's something you probably definitely should be doing anyway. You don't need the MMPI to help you evaluate for self-harm self risk. You should do that as all, part of your regular routine clinical assessments. But if someone elevates the component for feeling demoralized, and if they also are elevating problem areas uh, of hopelessness and suicidal ideation, and you can see the note here about that, then you absolutely should. And indeed, the, uh, the automatic report that you get from the scoring system will highlight this for you. Although again, you shouldn't need the MMPI to remind you to assess for self-harm and self uh, and suicide. That should be part of your regular clinical practice. Um, what else can we do with this? Well, it's, it's possible in terms of treatment planning that we make an initial treatment goal of reducing distress in some way. You know, we focus on that with the client because he or she is feeling very distressed. At least they're answering the questions on this test in a way that's associated with people who are experiencing a severe level of distress and demoralization. What about these other RC scales? Well, again, the approach is hopefully pretty similar, similar to what we've talked about before. We interpret in the extreme direction, the elevated direction, and some of the items can be interpreted in the sort of the low or absent direction. It depends. Um, however, we have to remember that this only makes sense if more than 90% of the items on those scales were responded to. So in the case of our particular fellow here, you might recall that he, um, <clears throat> endorsed uh, only, I think it was 47%, you know, less than half of the items on the cynicism scale. So um, we'll see here in a second whether we would want to interpret a low deflection on that scale um, anyway. But if we did, we'd have to probably not, or we'd have to, you know, check ourselves and, and not make that interpretation because we know he skipped a lot of items on that scale.
So what do we do about all this? Um, we note the diagnostic quality of these elevations. Um, they are not made to per se give us a diagnosis, but they inform our decisions about diagnosis. They give us treatment considerations. And to be clear, I guess I'm being a bit vague about that. If you look up in the treatment manual, I'm sorry, in the uh, administration scoring and interpretation manual, you can see um, treatment recommendations that accompany different patterns of elevation. If you use the computer um, scoring system, you get a uh, you get as part of your report information about treatment considerations. And so that can be very useful to the clinician, guiding his or her thinking about what to do next with this client, how what if any diagnosis to make, and then what if any treatment plan to make. So here's our client again. Now, if you look more towards the right hand side of the profile, you can see his restructured clinical scales. Well, what do we see here? Well, we see he has a low score on RC2. RC2 is the scale for low positive emotions. That's the scale which we might uh, previously have called the scale for depression. So low depression, and we can interpret it in the low direction because as you can see, he responded to 100% of those items. And the T-score, at least for the general population, is at 34. So maybe he's kind of, uh, you know, more positive or less depressed than is typical in the general population, although less so in the psychiatric population. You can also see here the he elevates RC6. RC6 is the uh, ideas of persecution scale or the scale that used to be called uh, paranoia or corresponds to what used to be called paranoia. And we can probably interpret that because he responded to 94% of the items on that scale. So that's not less than 90%. And he elevates as compared to the general population, although not so much so as compared to the male psychiatric population. And then we can also see here that he elevates RC8, which is aberrant experiences, which corresponds to the scale that used to be the schizophrenia scale. And he elevates the hypomanic activation scale, which corresponds to the scale on MMPI-2 that uh, is called the hypomania scale. And he elevates that quite a lot um, as compared to uh, both the general population or even the psychiatric inpatient population. So what's the overall sense we get of this guy? Well, it looks like he's got problems associated with behavior problems. He's maybe particularly energetic. Um, he feels sort of paranoid and persecuted. He's got some odd experiences and he's very uh, hypomanic in, in terms of his activity level. And that's um, certainly consistent with what we know about his history, at least based on that little bit of the report that I showed you earlier and his presenting concerns. So to try and represent this, uh, you know, pictographically, sort of, <laughs> I've got a lot of text on this, this slide, I realize, um, the RC scales allow us to look at, is there, uh, what in specific is the client's clinical presentation? What's he or she showing us or suggesting to us in term, based on how he or she responds to the items on the protocol. Uh, when we're interpreting the, uh, the protocol's profile, we just look for patterns of elevation. And we note that some of these scales, some of these RC scales can be interpreted in the low direction. Once we've handled the RC scales, we can move on to the specific problems or SP scales. And these are, as you might guess, designed to highlight important problems that the client has. Um, these are constructs that aren't directly addressed with uh, RC scales or that bridge across different RC scales. So to allow the overall MMPI to be more interpretable, these additional problem scales were conducted or were constructed because they highlight, of course, problems that the person might have. Uh, they're developed using factor analysis um, and the scales were evaluated, they were validated by comparing them to other scales and criteria for these various constructs, for these various specific problems. And, you know, generally speaking, they're all quite well validated. There are a lot of them. So as we've done before with the validity scales, we try and divide them into groups. And the first group is the broad kind of somatic cognitive scales group, which includes malaise, gastrointestinal complaints, head pain complaints, neurological complaints, and cognitive complaints. 
But by the way, it's worth noting that one of the things that's really neat about the MMPI2 RF is that it does really uh, highlight uh, kind of medical and semantic problems. That's done deliberately so that this test could be uh, more useful uh, for clinicians who work in hospital settings and maybe encounter people who have uh, you know, psychological or psychiatric problems, but might also have along with them other types of problems which could be related to medical concerns or could also be related to somatoform disorders. Second broad area of specific problems are all the internalizing scales. You can see them all here. They're things that correspond you know, to you know, mood disorders, uh, to anxiety disorders, um, and so on and so on. Then we've got our externalizing scales over here. It's our third big group. Um, they look like behavior problems, externalizing problems. Again, if you think back to our look at the higher order scale, the higher order scale kind of gives us a hint or a look ahead into the direction we might want to go. Like with our particular client here, we, we suspect that he's got externalizing and behavior problems. We probably want to focus on some of the specific problem scales that allow us to ex further explore or unpack what those problems might be. Then we've got our various interpersonal problem scales like uh, family problems, interpersonal passivity, social avoidance, etc. And those are the different problem scales. How do we handle them? Well, we interpret the SP scales a lot like we'd interpret the RC scales. Um, we look for extreme elevations, significant elevations, and in some cases, uh, low elevations or, or deflections in the low direction. That's not true for all of these problems, but some of them, and again, we always want to make sure that at least 90% of the items were responded to. If that wasn't the case, then it, you know, we can't really make an interpretation in any direction, but especially in the low direction, because of course, not a lot of questions were answered. What do we do about this? Well, we note diagnostic and treatment considerations based on the manual or based on our computer generated narrative. We focus on problems. You know, one of the virtues perhaps of the, uh, the MMPI2 RF is in a clinical setting where the, you need to gather a lot of information quickly. This test, although it takes a while for the client to respond to it and a little while for it to be scored up and for you as the clinician to read through it, can help you get a lot of information relatively quickly and maybe can highlight some problems that you ought to have focused on but maybe you forgot about or even missed just because you didn't have enough time to ask all the questions you wanted to. And that's a value there I think for many clinicians. If want to represent this somewhat pictographically we can say that the specific problems uh, scales allow us to identify or allow us to answer the question does the client have any specific problems that deserve our attention? How we observe that or how we record those is we note elevations and we of course remember that some of these SP scales can be interpreted in the low direction. Let's take a look at our fellow here. The first group, the somatic cognitive group. The second group, the internalizing group. Well, it looks like he's elevating for cognitive complaints as compared to the general population, although not so much so as compared to the um, as compared to the psychiatric inpatient population, although it's still fairly elevated. So cognitive complaints. If we look in our uh, internalizing uh, area, it looks like he's got uh, an elevation for suicidal ideation. Now, as I said before, we absolutely should have assessed suicidal risk, self-harm risk anyway. Maybe we already know that he has these problems, but if we didn't, we might have even more reason to do so at this point because we know that he's answered questions uh, in a way that's consistent with people who have elevated risk for suicide, whether we look at a general population or even at a psychiatric community uh, inpatient population. Uh, so that's, you know, that's a problem. That's, or at least that's something we absolutely would want. Those are specific, that is a specific problem that we absolutely would want to address, as are the cognitive complaints too. Moving over to the next three scales, I should say the next three sets of specific problem scales, we see elevation for heightened energy. We see elevation for aggressiveness. So those two scales at the end are problem scales at the end, aggressiveness and ACT for activity, kind of activity and energy level. And we see a deflection in the positive direction for interpersonal passivity. So he's relatively low passivity, low social avoidance. Um, and we might also uh, note that he has a relatively low level 
of that other scale um, in the uh, in the interpersonal problem scale, uh, social avoidance, so low passivity and low social avoidance, IPP and SAV respectively. So he's kind of a an intense guy, or at least he's answering questions in a way that's consistent with a pretty intense, energetic guy who's sort of up in everyone's face. Probably he's not passive, he's not avoidant, he's an intense dude, and um, those things are something are things that we might want to address in terms of our treatment planning. Here is some interesting information from the uh, the uh, protocol. Uh, I'm sorry for the protocol interpretation that we get from the scoring program, um, and a couple things to note here. I think this is really important. Um, uh, is the italicized part at the very top here? Clinical symptoms, personality characteristics, behavioral tendencies of the test taker are described in this section and organized according to an empirical, empirically guided framework. Statements containing the word reports are based on item content in MMPI2 RF scales, whereas statements containing the word likely are based on empirical correlates of these scales. I'll return to this point a little bit later, but the basic idea is some of what we're getting here is information that the client actually said, you know, stuff that he reported about himself. Some of what we're getting here are things which are correlated with patterns of responses that the client made. And as a clinician, we want to be a little bit careful about judging the difference between those two. Reports are more likely to be valid for the client because, of course, they're things that he or she is saying about himself or herself. Correlates are important too, but they are just that. They are correlates and they may not apply always to every single client. Um, with that in mind, you can see that some areas of um, dysfunction are highlighted here in terms of, uh, you know, sort of summarizing across the RC and the SP scales. You can imagine that if you'd administered this protocol and had sent it away uh, electronically probably to be scored, it's nice to get this summary back. You see his areas of, of somatic and cognitive concern, emotional dysfunction, thought dysfunction, and so on highlighted as such. We also see a little bit more here about his behavioral dysfunction and his interpersonal uh, dysfunction. I won't read all of that to you because you can obviously read it yourself. I made this point before but I'll return to it again here. The distinction between import reports versus empirical correlates. Reports are symptoms that the client or, or experiences, thoughts, feelings, behaviors that the client endorses. So if the test taker reports blah, 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 then that's something that the client has said about himself or herself. And assuming that the that we have reason to believe that their responding is valid, you know, if we've looked at their FL and K scales, and we think that they're being relatively uh, non-over-endorsing um, or non-under-endorsing, we think they're being essentially truthful, then we can say that this is probably true. These, these statements, these elevations are probably true for the client. Correlates are based on empirical research, and that's where uh, researchers have compared elevations on different scales of the MMPI to RF to other measures of other types of symptoms or problems. These may be true for our particular client, but that's not always going to be the case. You know, um, and it's also uh, assuming that the research findings are valid. Um, and that's where, uh, even as a clinician, it's important to be very familiar with the research on tests that you're doing. You know, take some time to read that literature so that you can feel confident when and when not to interpret empirical correlates of elevations on the scale. So to summarize here, um, an important point is the substance of scales are in a sense the heart of the MMPI2 RF. They're the, where you get the most information about the client. And as you hopefully saw here, they move in a direction from the more general, the de, you know higher order factors, to the more specific, the demoralization factor and the RC, uh, other RC scales and the specific problems. Um, they're based on what the client actually says, that what he or she reports, and they also, in terms of the report, um, I'm sorry, in terms of the um, the report which is, is given to us by the scoring system may also give us some correlates for what may be true for that particular client. Okay, well if you're with me so far, you know, give yourself a pat on the back because you've stuck with it. And now we're at the very end and we're looking at the other scales. And there's less of them here, so that's good, I suppose. Um, but they're worth some attention. They include the personality psychopathology scales, or the Psi 5, and two interest scales. Personality psychopathology is uh, scales are based on a kind of a temperament-oriented pathology notion. They're this idea that there are persistent and pervasive problems that people can have that are personality or personality-like. 
and uh, we can measure them. Um, these particular scales were developed using factor analysis and the scales were compared to other criteria and other scales for these different constructs. And to, uh, to be a bit sort of uh, brief in summary, they're fairly well validated as measures of personality psychopathology. Here they all are, um, negative emotionality, psychoticism, introversion, disconstraint, and aggressiveness. These are clearly um, sort of temperament slash personality type qualities that you might be very interested in as a clinician if you're evaluating or assessing a client. The Psi 5 scales are pretty easy to interpret, at least you know, the approach to them is pretty similar to what we've seen so far. We can interpret elevations that are over 60, T-score 65, and we can also interpret elevations which are less than T-score 40, um, uh, is indicating a rel relatively high, relatively low, respectively, level of pathology in that particular area. And again, you know, the, the point that I've made a few times before, but I'll make again, is that this assumes that 90% or more of the items that go onto that scale have been endorsed. So the basic approach is pretty similar to what we've seen with the previous substantive scales. What do we do about them? Well, we note for diagnostic purposes and treatment considerations uh, any elevations. We look at the manual or we look at the computer generated narrative to get a sense of if there are important um, correlates or, or recommendations that can be made based on these elevations. Here's our client and you can see here that he elevates at least compared to the general population his level of aggressiveness uh, on the first of the Psi 5 scale sci five scales. Um, he doesn't elevate so much as compared to uh, psychiatric inpatients. He has low levels of social introversion, so he's uh, you know definitely kind of uh, an intense guy, or I shouldn't say definitely. He is responding in a way that's consistent with someone who's not very introverted. They are more socially extroverted, maybe a little bit socially intense. Uh, that's something which is maybe consistent with his presentation of someone with a history of hypomania and he's presenting, I believe, with mania, uh, hypomania and other psychotic features. So if we try and represent what the sci five gives us, it's, does the client have any personality pathology, uh, things that would be relevant for diagnosis or might be, guide our treatment considerations? We just note these elevations on the sci five scales, and as I indicated before, all the sci five scales can be in, interpreted in the low direction, assuming that the person has responded to at least 90% of the items that go on that scale, which, by the way, in the case of our client, he did. Lastly, interest scales. These seem a little bit quaint and curious at the very end after all this psychopathology. Uh, these are just scales developed with factor analysis uh, and compared to other scales of interest in two broad areas. Aesthetic and literary concerns and mathematical and physical concerns. And I don't know, in a way this maybe reflects that sort of traditional in the world of education notion of kind of language and book learning versus math and sort of physical learning maybe, I mean, broadly, or, uh, you know, like the bookish kid who stays inside versus the, uh, you know, in, you know, the sort of extroverted kid who runs around outside and builds things, maybe. Um, anyway, those are the two broad interests that we have on this test. And uh, the interpretation is pretty straightforward. Like the RC and SP scales, we interpret elevations over, at or above 65, or deflections below 40, um, assuming that 90% of the items were responded to. And we note interests. Um, lack of interests generally may be a treatment focus. You know, if you had a client who had little interest in either area, you might, uh, that might be consistent with someone with low behavioral activation. Perhaps they are also depressed, especially if you can see elevations on the appropriate RC scales and problem scales. So it might look like someone was kind of a very depressed, or in the case of someone who's psychotic, maybe they have kind of a catatonic presentation. That could be a treatment focus. Um, in our case here, we're just asking, are there general levels of interest that the client has? We can note elevations and we can interpret them in the low direction if we want. Here's our fellow. Um, you can see here that he uh, has low aesthetic interest, high mechanical interest, although as you maybe recall, or I will show you in just a second, he responded to less than 90% uh, of the items on the aesthetic interest scale. So his low level or his deflection in the downward direction on that is probably not all that interpretable.
So again, if you think way back to the beginning of this little talk through that I gave you, you may report or you may remember that he responds to only 86% of the items on the aesthetic literary interest scale. He cannot say uh, responded to the remaining 14%. So we probably wouldn't want to interpret this scale, or at least be very cautious. I mean. Who knows why this guy skipped those items. We might even query him about this later on if we were planning treatment. Uh, but beyond that, we wouldn't probably make too much of it. Important point. Other scales provide information. How interesting or important this information is depends a lot on the client and on the context. Conclusions. How do we put all this stuff together? Again, there are over 50 scales, or 51. Um, that's a lot of information. What do we make of all of it? Well, making sense of the MMPI2 RF involves working through steps, uh, as I suggest, sort of the val validity scales first, the substantive scales next, and then, if necessary or if of interest, the other scales, and maybe especially the Sci 5 scales. You're following this kind of progression all the way down. And you're looking for elevations on scales. You're constantly scanning for elevations in those profiles. And you're following a more path, uh, following a path of more general to more specific pathology. Can you narrow in or focus in from generally speaking to specific, sp more specifically speaking, where this person's pathology is? Um, organizing these elevations can help you generate uh, areas of concern or specific loci within those areas of concern and help you kind of ask, answer the question, what's the data telling me? What other assessments might I like to do to follow up from this MMPI? So, you know, to, to briefly note here, um, how uh, the profile, uh, I'm sorry, how the re scored reports typically organize this is in terms of the validity scales, the somatic and cognitive dysfunction scales. These are the various that's RC1 plus various problem scales, emotional dysfunction, that's various problem and RC scales, um, thought dysfunction, behavioral dysfunction, interpersonal dysfunction, and of course in the very end, interests. So you've got <coughs> higher order scales, which kind of guide your thinking. Then you've got clinical and, sub and problem scales and sci fi scales. And you put those all together in different combinations and you get these broad areas of concern. And those are reflected on the narrative that the computer gives you. Or if you were just trying to make this, you know, kind of do the interpretation yourself, you might want to organize in this way uh, to see your patterns emerging. So if you get the report uh, from the scoring service, you'll actually see organization that looks like this. There's uh, validity in the three broad areas I described the various substantive uh, scales for somatic cognitive dysfunction, emotional dysfunction, thought dysfunction, and so on. And you can see the different scales that go into those broad areas. So here, the pattern that jumps out the most, at least if you're sort of familiar and trained to look at this stuff a lot, is most of what's going on with this guy is in the area of thought dysfunction. He's got a lot of problems there. His elevations are kind of at or above uh, 65 in most of those uh, areas, both in terms of the broad area of thought dysfunction and RC6, RC8, and uh, psych R. Then we also see some elevations in terms of his behavioral dysfunction. So he's got elevations in terms of how he's acting out. Putting it all together, the MMPI-2 RF is one of the most commonly used clinical instruments. It's used in a wide variety of contexts. Uh, for assessment. It's complicated to use, especially interpreting the validity scales, but the computerized scoring and the narrative helps, and just some basic familiarity and some thinking through the process helps. And hopefully, as long as this recording has been almost two hours long, so thank you for your patience, uh, hopefully this has been kind of helpful for you to organize it all together, uh, you know, in your minds and in my mind as well. So if you've made it this far, thanks for your attention. I'm going to go fix yourself a cup of tea or a cup of coffee, take a break for a moment. And uh, when you're ready, come back, ask me some questions on Blackboard or on YouTube or even in class if you're enrolled in my class. Thanks so much, guys. I really do appreciate your attention. Bye-bye.